course, as you might imagine, after two years of dragging out everything they could, blocking passage of literally hundreds of House bills, stonewalling uncontroversial nominees, denying straight up or down votes to bills with majority support. You can imagine what impact bipartisan Senate passage of bills supported by the American people has had on some of the most seasoned Republican Senate veterans. That's right. It's hurt their fifis. Republicans are angry that Senate leader Harry Reid has packed the Senate's final days with legislation, making them actually work on stuff instead of getting their holiday shopping done. Senator John McCain, for one, reacted to Reid's plan of passing this stuff now, before a new, more Republican Senate comes to town, by announcing that he will never love again. The American people have spoken, and you are acting in direct repudiation of the message of the American people. That's why they're jamming through this. And my friends, there's a lot of talk about compromise. There's a lot of talk about working together. You think what th this bizarro world that the majority leader has been uh, carrying us in of, of uh, cloture votes on this, uh, votes on various issues that are on the political agenda of the other side, is somehow think that beginning next January 5th, we will all love one another in Kumbaya? I don't think so. No kumbaya. That was after Friday night, when Senator Lindsey Graham contemplated the possibility of considering the new START treaty this week and replied, Calgon, take me away. It's been a week from hell. It's been a week of where you're dealing with a lot of big issues from taxes to funding the government to special interest politics. And I've had some time to think about START, but not a lot. And it's really wearing on the body. Senator Graham has actually had more than some time to think about the START Treaty. It was signed on April 8th. And Senate debate on it has lasted longer than debate on its last two predecessors combined. Perhaps the most fascinating twist on Republican opposition to start being how much of it arose as a threat to the administration not to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. The Republican Party leadership putting itself in the position of claiming the treaty will make U.S. vulnerable to nuclear missiles from North Korea and Iran, but they would have voted for it, no problem, if only gays had been kept out of the military. Huh? If you really want to have a chance of passing START, you better start over and do it the next Congress because this lame duck has been poisoned. Let's bring in David Korn, Washington Bureau Chief for Mother Jones Magazine, a columnist of PoliticsDaily.com. David, good evening. Good evening, Chris. Uh, am I wrong that John McCain has just acted in the most petulant, disgraceful manner of any national political figure in a very long time during this lame duck session? I am taking my treaty and I'm going home. <laughs> I mean, it's like the lame duck has been poisoned. This is a week from hell. I, it, it's, I have a general theory of social evolution, which is that life doesn't get much, much beyond high school level in any field. But I tell you, John McCain and Lindsey Graham are really proving it this week. They're acting like spoiled brats. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to give you your treaty. I don't care about the real substance of nuclear arms reductions in this world, but I'm not going to give it to you because you're voting on something else. And it's, it's, uh, it's, re it's remarkable they've been so sort of um, bald-faced about it. I mean, they, 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 they honestly have run to the press. I mean, Corker was doing, doing this as well, basically saying, mm -hmm. you know, this treaty, which, which the substance of which we're, we're okay with, even though they've been trying to kill it in all sorts of ways, yeah. we're, we're really going to hold this hostage because we don't what? Because this is other vote. Because of the, because of the gays. Right. Yes. You know, I mean, but but let, me, let me give you a pop quiz. Pop quiz. What was John McCain's slogan in the 2008 campaign? Country first. Country first. Do I get you a prize? Win. You get a prize. <laughs> I'll send it to you in the mail. But country first. Is that what we're seeing this week? Right. This is the, the lame ducks and poison. This is hell. God, we have to work. Didn't these guys ever see Jimmy Stewart and Mr. Smith comes to Washington? I mean, he, he, Lindsey Graham looked like, you know, because he's working maybe... 10, 12 hours a day for a couple of days of the session, he is totally out of whack. I mean, most Americans, a lot of Americans, are working two, three jobs a week. I don't know. I, I, I think these guys are really shooting themselves in the foot this week. Uh, forget kumbaya. I think that you know, the American public is looking at them and seeing jokes. Lindsey Graham also, I think, I mean, you know, to the extent that there is this sort of press around Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham is sort of McCain 2.0 in terms of the Beltway Press's sort of love affair with a Republican who's reasonable and, like, yeah. you know, doesn't want to torture too much. Um, and he himself has been sort of acting in a similar way. I sort of wonder what it does to the Lindsey Graham brand uh, down, down the line and particularly into the next Congress. 
You know, I, I, I tend to believe that in politics, having a hissy fit is usually not good for business. And, um, you know, earlier in the year, there was a, a wonderful piece by Ryan Lizza in The New Yorker in which John McCain got mad at Lindsey Graham for trying to take the maverick mantle away from him. So this is really coming across like a lot of high school activity. And Lindsey Graham, who was trying to be a responsible Republican at some point in the last two years, really seems to have blown it this week. He's just now... Um, He's, 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 he's a McCain wannabe, but only in terms of crankiness. Final question. I want to get your, your, your thoughts on this, uh, on the strategy here, because what, it occurred to me today that if, if START does pass, and it is now looking like it's going to pass, you have two different models. With the tax cut deal, basically the White House blinked and they cut a deal because the, the Republicans were saying, we're going to hold these other things hostage mm -hmm. unless you deal with it. They said the same thing about START, and the White House and Harry Reid went ahead anyway and called the bluff with the don't ask, don't tell repeal vote, and it looks like they're going to get start. And I wonder what that says about what, how much Republicans are bluffing when they do this kind of thing. Well, I think on the tax cut deal, the president's argument was that, that he was playing chicken with a bunch of people who were irresponsible and, if they, and who were actually willing at the time to let the tax cuts uh, extensions not continue for middle class, to let unemployment insurance just not go on, and that come the next... Congress, they wouldn't be so keen on delivering right. these progressive policy initiatives. So I th and, I, and I do believe that most of the senators, Republican senators, would have been happy to say no to unemployment insurance. So the president was really backed into the corner. I think start is a little bit different. Uh, dropping, you know, if, if it went on to the next Congress, it wouldn't be good for the United States, it wouldn't be good for our national security interests, but again, it wouldn't take, you know, 20, 30 million Americans and cut them off from checks. So I think the I president see. had a little more room to maneuver with START, and that strengthens your negotiating hand when you have more room to maneuver. David Korn, Negotiating 101, Washington editor for Mother Jones. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Chris.